Hello, everyone. My name is Mohan Rajakram. I am the CTO of Chainyard, a blockchain company. Now, early on, back in 2016, we had written an application called Auction on the Blockchain. At that time, our purpose and intent was to understand how the Fabric works. And Fabric is a blockchain platform that IBM has developed and contributed to the open source community. Our intent at that time was to see how do we exploit features, how do we write a front-end application that can talk to the blockchain. These were all very curious questions when blockchain was still at its infancy. Now, we wrote that application at that time, and it had a lot of previews from uh, people like developers as well as uh, other curious folks alike. Now, what we did is, uh, as the blockchain platform evolved over time, uh, it came from 0.5 to 0.6, and today we are at Fabric 1.1. And a lot of new features have been added to this platform. So we thought, why not we take that old application and then migrate it to the 1.1 version and show it to our audience once again. Now, there are a few things that we have done. The earlier application was directly talking to the blockchain, directly from the browser to the blockchain. Now, changes have happened where the only way by which one can talk to the blockchain is through an intermediate SDK layer. So what we have done, some of the changes we have done is put on a front end that talks to a SDK layer that is part of the hyperledger fabric implementation. And that middle layer talks to the blockchain itself. Now, a brief a recollection about the app itself. The idea, intent, the idea and the intent at that time was how can we do high value art items trading on the blockchain? A typical eBay-like uh, business scenario. However, here what happens is we have a bunch of business participants. We have the seller, we have the buyer, we have auction houses, we have the bank, shipping, um, and logistics operators, as well as insurance companies. Normally what happens is there are people who own art items and they want to register it on the blockchain for making sure there's an authentic representation of the piece of art that they own. Essentially, the idea is to get rid of fakes. And there are people who would like to buy art and collect it, like the buyers. What we do here is when a seller is intending to sell the piece of art, he puts it on the blockchain and some auction house like Sotheby's picks it up. They evaluate the piece of art, they give it to their validators, and once the piece of art is genuine, they put it on the auction block. And a number of bidders can bid on it, and in our demo, we will have some seller who bids on it and takes possession of that piece of art. Now, without much ado, I would like to have a demo of this application, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, James Crossan. He is our senior consultant in the blockchain practice, and I want James to take it over and give us a good demo. Thank you very much, Mohan. Hi, everyone. My name is James Croson. I am a senior UI UX designer at Chainyard. What I'm going to show you today is the auction app. Now, what you're seeing is the seller's view. We actually have three different users in the app. The first is the auction house itself. Then we have a seller who we're calling Ashley and Cindy as the buyer. Now the buyer's role in this app is to bid and purchase items that are listed by the seller. The seller, of course, sells artwork and the auction house is uh, kind of sits in between the buyer and the seller and they can open auctions for bidding. So I'm gonna to start today by showing you the uh, seller's view on the app. You can see at the top that there's no auctions happening right now. If I scroll down a little bit more, I can see that Ashley has five pieces of artwork in her collection. I'm gonna go ahead and view the Starry Night. You can see a modal appear. You can see the name of it, the price, some metadata about that artwork, such as the uh, type and the medium that it was created in. You can see the size of it in inches and its creation date, as well as a short description. Now at the bottom of this modal, you'll see a button that says show history. This is actually showing the history of that art asset as it passes through the blockchain and as transactions are recorded on the blockchain. So if I show you the first one, you can see that it was recorded as initial on the blockchain and the owner was Ashley Hart. It also gives you a time uh, kind of timestamp as well. Secondly, you can see that Ashley uh, submitted this piece of art for auction on the blockchain. Um, and it also lists the, the uh, timestamp too. 
Finally, we show the AES key to the <coughs> owner of the particular piece of art. So James, do we show the owner AES key to any other person other than the owner of the artwork? No, we only show it to the actual owner of that artwork for security reasons, because otherwise that would kind of jeopardize the whole app um, and it would mean that other people could come in and, and uh, change things for that particular piece of art. That sounds great. Uh, one more thing, James. Sure. Uh, what was the app written in? So the front end is actually built using React.js. After that, I'm actually going to show you how to submit a piece of art for auction. I'm going to give it a base price, sorry, a buy it now price at the top, and a reserve price. And this is very similar to sites like eBay. Once I click Submit for Auction, we're actually going to switch over and see the auction house view. Before I do that, though, you might have noticed a block fly in at the bottom of the screen. Now, what that actually shows is a kind of look into the blockchain itself. And every time um, a transaction is made, you'll see more and more blocks appear at the bottom. You can see a block ID if you hover over it, a transaction ID, a timestamp, and who created that block on the blockchain. So I'm going to switch over to the auction house now. And you can see that there's two pieces of art listed. One of them is currently open for auction. I can also hover over the show ID button and see the ID of that particular asset on the blockchain. And I can see other things like the reserve price or the buyer now price um, for, for that particular piece of art and the time remaining as well on the auction. I'm going to go ahead and as the auction house open up this particular piece of art for auction and give it two minutes. Now I'm going to switch over and see the buyer in this application, Cindy. Now her view is kind of similar, but you can see that there's two open auctions going on right now. I'm gonna click bid on the uh, piece of art that was listed just, just a second ago. And you can see it's a similar view as before. We can see the name, some metadata, the size of it, and the description. But if you look at the bottom of the modal, you can see a kind of bidding view. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, place a bid on this artwork. I can, uh, James, I can see that you're not showing the AES key. Absolutely right. Yeah, because this person doesn't own that particular piece of art, so we wouldn't want to display that. That's only really shown to the owner of the artwork. And I can see that you are displaying just the watermark image, not the actual image. Yeah. Right, that's a great question. We're actually showing a watermarked image, again, because this person doesn't own this particular piece of art, um, and it's another way for this application to kind of secure the asset on the blockchain and uh, prevent fraud from happening. That's great. So I've placed a bid. I will switch back to the auction house view to show you um, the kind of updated status um, on this particular piece of art. So now that it's refreshed, you can see that the buyer, Cindy, has actually made the highest bid. And the auction house can see that over here on the right. Now uh, there's 25 seconds left on this auction. So what happens when the auction actually closes is that uh, more transactions are made to the blockchain and that the highest bidder will have this particular piece of art transferred to them on the blockchain itself. So once it closes down in five seconds, the view will refresh. Um, the status will also change from open to closed. Now there is uh, something that you're not showing, James, here is that there could be many bidders and they could be running this application on their mobile phone or they could be running it on their desktop, but they all can bid simultaneously. Right. Right. This app is configured to um, take multiple bidding requests and it will automatically determine the highest bidder and resolve the, the um, artwork so that it, it is transferred to the, the highest bidder only. So let's switch back to the buyer. And you can see now that that piece of artwork has been transferred into their collection. I can view it as before. I can click show history. And you'll see that there's a lot more history recorded on this particular piece of art. You can see that when it was uh, ready for auction from the seller, Ashley, and that it was changed to, be a, to have a new owner as Cindy, the buyer. I just want to add one piece on the history is that the history is actually recorded by the blockchain. And 
technically, we are actually requesting the blockchain to show us transaction history about any piece of asset. Right. The final thing I will show you is transferring an asset. So rather than bidding on an asset or buying an asset outright, what I can actually do is transfer an asset to another user free of charge. So there's no monetary transaction happening. I specify a username and transfer it. You can see that the artwork disappears from the collection. And if I switch back to the seller, you'll see the artwork appear in their collection. Now, the final thing I want to show you with the seller is actually adding a new artwork onto the blockchain. I can click add artwork, the add artwork button in the top right. I'm, I'm going to give it a name, it's houses, a short description, and a creation date. I can also fill out some metadata about this particular piece of art. I'm going to give it a size of 100 by 100 inches and give it a base price. Now, finally, I have the option of uploading either a photo of the artwork or a photo of the certif certificate of authenticity. And the great thing about that is by storing the certificate of authenticity on the blockchain is that it, it makes it super secure because a blockchain is immutable, things can't be changed, and you can track things very easily along the blockchain. And also that certificate can be easily transferred from one user to another. So I'm gonna upload the uh, actual photo of the artwork, save that, and once the view refreshes, you can see the new artwork exists in my artwork collection. I do want to add one point, you know, at that point when you actually submit the art to be recorded against you, an AES key is generated by the uh, system uh, in order to encrypt the piece of art and store it on the chain. And the key is handed over to the actual owner of the piece of art as the uh, proof that only they alone can either view it or even submit it for auction. Is that, is that right? That's right. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So. If I, if I view it now, I can actually see um, on the history those transactions being made. And you can see that I'm now the, the new owner of this particular piece of art. So that's really all of the, um, all of the app. Thank that's you. very good. I think like, uh, it's a fantastic app. You've done a great job, James. What I'd like Sandeep to do is uh, Sandeep, our senior developer and consultant, in our practice to show what is the magic behind this uh, application, uh, what kind of code is written either on the client side as well as the smart contract side. Uh, just give us a uh, give our audience a free view. Uh, sure, Rohan. Hello, my name is uh, Sandeep Puloru. I'm a blockchain consultant at Chainyard. James just showed you how adding an artwork works from the UI. Now I'm going to walk you through how adding an artwork works from chain code and REST, REST API perspective. Let's start with the REST API and then we'll move on to chain code. As you can see, we have organized the code into different folders. We have separate folders for chain code, REST API, and the UI. We try to modularize the code as much as possible so that it can be reused in other projects as well. Let's start with the REST API here. In the REST API, node, app, controllers, we have four different controllers. First one is the auction controller, which we use for creating and closing auction requests. Bid controller for creating bids. User controller for registering users. The controller we are right now interested in is the item controller. That is where adding an artwork to the ledger happens. Let me open item controller here. So on line 41, you can see item controller create item. This is a method that adds artwork on the ledger. When a user adds an artwork on the UI. UI converts the image associated with the artwork into a base64 string, sends it as part of a JSON object to the node layer. Node layer receives this JSON object on line 46. Once we have this JSON object, we create an AES key, a random 32 byte AES key, encrypt the base64 string using this AES key. Once the encryption is done and we have the JSON object ready. We convert the JSON object to a string and send it to the ledger on line 61 using invoke transaction. So invoke transaction basically takes 
this JSON string, adds it to the ledger, and once we receive a success response that the artwork got added on the ledger, we then take the base64 image, convert it into a watermark thumbnail, and save it in the public folder. So only an owner of the artwork will be able to see the actual image. Any other person will only be able to see the watermark thumbnail image that is stored in the public images folder. So Sandeep, the, the invoke function is a chain code API call, right? That is the call that the Fabric uh, chain code API provides for you to uh, record anything on the blockchain. That is correct. Or process a smart contract function. That is correct. So that is what I'm going to show you, what happens when an invoke transaction happens on the node. So let's move on to the chain code and see how it, how it exactly works. Similar to Node, we try to organize the code in chain code as well as different smart contracts. As you can see, we have different smart contracts for auction, bid, item. Let me open up item.go. In item.go, on line 34, you can see the struct we defined, which is associated with the artwork. Uh, it, has, it has a lot of metadata associated with it. As you can see, we have the AES key associated with the artwork the item base price associated with the artwork, current owner ID, and we are also storing the encrypted base64 string in the item struct as well. Let's move on to the create item smart contract. So this is the method that gets executed when invoke transaction gets called on the node layer. So the JSON string that the node layer sends is received as an argument in the create item method. Once we have the JSON string, we unmarshal and convert it into a item object that was defined above. Once we have the item object, we check if the owner associated with the item is a valid and registered, registered user. So if, if the owner is valid, then we move on and check if the item ID associated with the auction item is unique. If it is not, we send an error response to the node saying that auction item with the ID already exists. If everything is good, we set the auction item in item status as initial, convert the auction item to bytes, and save it on the ledger. Saving on, on the ledger happens in update object method, which takes the auction item bytes, creates a key, the combination of art INV and the item ID, and calls put state on the ledger, which saves the artwork on the ledger. Once the artwork is saved, we send the auction item bytes to the node layer, which converts it into a JSON object and sends it back to the UI, which is then displayed on the UI. Okay, thank you. Now, a couple of things that I noticed is like we, we have written a higher level API to record on the blockchain, like update and uh, record. So I, I guess like the underlying architecture uses the, the basic uh, chain code API, like put state and get state. The other observation that you would all have made is that we actually store the AES key on the chain. Now, uh, that is not a correct implementation because all the participants on the blockchain can see that particular piece of information. But in a future version, we, are, we would leverage uh, other techniques such as SiteDB or HSM or an off-chain location to uh, save this, uh, this attribute right, because this is a secure attribute. So there are certain things that you would notice here, which is not a uh, good practice. Uh, we do uh, intend to update this into a different version and we will leverage site DB and uh, channels uh, more effectively in a subsequent version of this application. If you did enjoy this particular video and our explanation of, our, uh, of this application, please feel free to visit us on www.chainyard.com or send us an email through that channel or send an email to mohan at itpeoplecorp.com or mohan at chainyard.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.